This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. And welcome to another edition of Silent Voices, the only program here in America that you, the viewer, can express your opinion and tell your story about the child welfare system. I am Dennis Lawrence, and beside me is Maria. Tell me, Maria, what do we have today? Today I would like to give a special shout out for those of you who tune in each week to hear the stories and issues that people have with the Family Court and CPS. Today we are on our first segment. We're going to Baby LK. Baby LK has put together a comedy act for us. Here he is, Baby LK anti-CPS comedy routine. Good evening. Your family court judge and your caseworker are trapped in a burning building, but you only have time to save one of them. So do you go to lunch or go to a movie? <laughs> What's the difference between a social worker and a pit bull terrier? What? At least you can get part of your baby back from the pit bull. <laughs> Hefty bags, the unofficial luggage of the foster care system. <laughs> This foster mother has never been able to tell the twins apart, and so she decided to measure them, and it helped, too, because the girl is three inches shorter than the boy. <laughs> okay, this desperate-to-adopt couple was absolutely delighted when finally their long wait to adopt a baby came to an end. The adoption center called and told them that they had this wonderful Russian baby boy when the couple took him without hesitation. On the way home from the adoption center, they stopped by the local college so they could each enroll in night classes. So they go in and fill out all the forms and the registration clerk asks whatever possessed you to study Russian and the woman replies we just adopted a Russian baby and in a year or so he'll start to talk so we just wanted to be able to understand him <laughs> what's the difference between God and a social worker huh God doesn't pretend to be a social worker <laughs> God admits that the social worker could be wrong. God tells his clients the social workers do exist. One night, these two social workers were walking through a rough part of the city when suddenly they heard moans and cries for help from a back alley. Upon investigation, they found a semi-conscious man in a pool of blood. Help me, I've been mugged and viciously beaten, he pleaded. So the two social workers then turned and walked away. One said to the other, you know, the person that did this really needs help. <laughs> what do you call a thousand child protective workers all chained up together at the bottom of the ocean? I don't know. A really good start. <laughs> Why do they bury child protective workers 300 feet underground? I don't know. Because deep down, they are really good people. <laughs> A little boy is talking to his school guidance counselor after having problems at home. The counselor asks him if he would like to go live with his father, and the boy says, no, he beats me. Well, how about your aunt? asked the counselor. No, the little boy said, because she beats me too. So the counselor asks, well, who do you want to live with then? And the little boy thinks for a minute and says, I want to go live with the Cleveland Browns because they never beat anybody. <laughs> Knock, knock. Who's there? An adoptee. <laughs> what do you call a foster kid who's hanging on a hook on a wall? <laughs> Art. <laughs> Why do male social workers prefer briefs to boxers? I don't know. Because they prefer a warm, supportive environment. <laughs> so this family court judge says to a mother, you do understand that you have sworn to tell the truth. And the mother says, yes, I do. So the judge asks her, do you understand what will happen if you are not truthful? And the mother says, sure, I get everything I want. <laughs> so the judge turns to the father and asks, do you have anything to offer this court before I issue my judgment? And the father says, no, your honor, my lawyer took it off. <laughs> 
How many birth fathers does it take to screw in a light bulb? I don't know. Light bulb? What light bulb? I didn't screw any damn light bulb. It's not my light bulb, and I don't know anything about it. <laughs> How many family law judges does it take to change a light bulb? Just one, but two lawyers have to explain how to do it. <laughs> how many social workers does it take to screw in a light bulb? I don't know. The light bulb doesn't need to change. It's the system that needs changing. <laughs> a mugger comes up behind a social worker, sticks a gun in her back, and says, Your money or your life. And the social worker says, I'm sorry, but I'm a social worker, so I don't have any money or a life. <laughs> Did you hear about the social worker firing squad? No, I haven't. They all stood in a circle. <laughs> How do you tell when a child protective worker is lying? Her lips move. <laughs> Good night. And we could even be laughing a little bit after that, because it's what... <laughs> ho, ho, ho. <laughs> All right, camera on Maria. <laughs> Thank you, Baby LK. Not only can you help give us the news, but you can also make us laugh. You're a great comedian. Next up on the agenda, a young lady from Lansing, Michigan area, Cassandra Bertorf, would like to tell us her story on dealing with the corruption. Hi, and we want to thank you and welcome you to another episode of Silent Voices. Today we have Cassandra Bertorf with us, who's been through a lot with the family court systems, and um, we just want to thank you for coming on the show. I would like to ask you first, now you have a son, and um, Robert, and what is his age? Uh, he just turned 10 November 7th, two, 2014. Okay, and it's my understanding that Robert was removed. Um, what was he exactly removed from the home for? Um, in around 2006, I was going through a rough patch, and I did have a um, drug issue. So um, somebody had called Child Protective Services and um, they had first came out a couple months before that and said everything was fine, that Robert had a home and everything. Um, during this time we had moved like kind of across the street to a different apartment building and um, the police, I had gotten, it was a domestic violence case, I had talked to my dad about something then it had got uh, through to somebody else in the family and they had called CPS and the CPS had came and they knocked on the door, nobody answered the door and then um, they called the police, which is supposed to be the other way around. The police is supposed to come for a welfare check and then the CPS worker is supposed to come. That's not how they did it, they did it backwards. Um, and they came in and got my son on December 2nd, 2006 um, and there was no kind of abuse, no kind of emergency order to get him out of the house. So they basically illegally seized my son um, on November 2nd, 2006. But they didn't have the paperwork, I have it right here, to seize him until December 4th, 2006. So that's 24 hours later. Okay. So now, just to clear up something. 48 hours, excuse me. Okay, just okay. to clear up something or clarify, um, you are now, and you admit you had some issues then, but you are now currently drug-free and re rehabilitated? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so you've really turned your life around and, you know, gotten everything together. Why was there, as far as um, the information you received, why was there no order of removal until December 4th? Um, according to my family, my dad said that my, because it was actually my brother, you know, that had called on me. According to my dad, he said they had did that in the middle of the week. I'm, I'm guessing, you know, it was just by the paperwork and everything that I found out since then, they waited so that they could remove him illegally, um, and under certain grounds because the dates don't match up. The time that the CPS was called, since I do know who the caller was, 
and exactly when they came and got him does not match up. Right. So they kind of went, they went around the loopholes to try to steal my son from me, and they did it every, any way they could do it. Okay, and I just wanted to um, clarify that we at Silent Voices here take drug and alcohol addictions very seriously, and I wanted to say that that's, you know, we're really proud of you for, you know, taking the steps that you, you needed to to get yourself clean and do what you did for your son. Now, you went to rehab for three months, and um, you would have liked to entrust your son with your father, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Um, my son, Robert William Bergtorf III, is named after my father, Robert William Bergtorf Jr. The reason um, why my son and my, my father, his <coughs> grandfather, were very close, um, they, were, they were very close, and um, the reason why they said that my dad could not have him is because he was a truck driver. My sister was in foster care a few years before this, and my dad fought to get her out. He worked at GM for um, over 10 years, Goodyear for, over, I think at GM 20 years, and Goodyear for at least 10 years. I mean, he's a reputable man, he's a good man in the community, pays his taxes, he has no drug or criminal history, absolutely nothing wrong with him, and he was denied custody of my son while I was in rehab and my son my father kept trying to get Robert and they denied him did they give a reason why they were denying him they said because he was a truck driver and my father told them that he would come off the road and you know he had a house and everything he just had the buyout from GM it would have been very easy for him to take care of Robert and he's a master mechanic it's not hard for you know that occupation to get a job Okay, and why, um, in your understanding, <clears throat> now it, it's I've got, I've got some things here. You were diagnosed with quite a few things by mm -hmm. um, was it CPS? Um, I was working with Child Protective Services, actually Child and Family Services on Five Oaks Drive in Lansing. I was working with them. My first case worker was Christine Sayers. Um, she was supposed, you know. She got me involved into some mental health after I got out of rehab, and they told me that I had to take this medication in order to get my son back, and it was Seroquel. They diagnosed me with bipolar at the time um, and put me on up to 800 milligrams of Seroquel during this fight. Um, that was community mental health. Now, community mental health was working with Child and Family Services on Five Oaks Drive to take my son from me because I have never went there until they made me go there to get my son back. It was like I had to see multiple caseworkers. I had to deal with multiple people, and they made me sign a release between each one of them. So everybody was sharing information, and I'm only here just like trying to fight to get my son back. You know, it was like I got a whole team against just me. Right. Now, there's something that we talked about before the show um, that really jumped out on me, you know, at me and just, you know, set me back. I seen that and I thought, wow, that's really, and, and that is um, that in the process of child services diagnosing <clears throat> Cassandra with certain issues, one of them issues was pedophilia. Yes, ma'am. And I'm sure you're all, you know, sitting there with your eyes huge. I was, too. Um, what I wanted to ask you and share with the viewers is that have you ever, in the course of your years on Earth, been inappropriate with or even accused of being inappropriate with a child? No, ma'am. Actually, what had happened was um, during the year and a half fight, it was only neglect. So this is the only child I've been in contact with is my son. And that was while you were on drugs, so that's what you were working towards, straightening it out, you know, and getting... No, they did not. They waited until after they forced me to sign off my rights, and was it January, February, March, April, May 2008, to January 2009 when my son's, the exact year and month that my son was adopted out to put this on my record as a pedophilia. 
What I'm saying is why they waited until, if it was true, why did they wait all the way until he was adopted out? Right. Why wouldn't, I would immediately, and who's going to help a pedophile? Yeah. That's the one diagnosis you need to give somebody if you want to discredit anything they say to you. Now, do you still have that diagnosis? No, ma'am. They took it off my record. They did? Yes, ma'am. Was there any other diagnosis that they took off your record as well? No, ma'am. That's the only one I fought for because I knew it was, it was injustice to me. Mm -hmm. And I walked around like that for five years and just found out about it in February. Okay. And just got it took off. It took them three months to take it off after I found out about it. So, and now you still have these other... Um, who diagnosed you with these mental health issues? Was it CPS or was it a psychiatrist? Um, I worked with the psychiatrist at child and family services they diagnosed me as bipolar which is not my diagnosis i have borderline personality disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder them are the two problems that i do have and um they diagnosed me they were using community mental health to take my son from me because i was told that if i didn't if i stopped going to community mental health my son would be taken from me so either way i had to do it and this is how they got this into my paperwork. Now, obviously, they got a copy of all that because there was a release sign during that time. So they have a copy of this diagnosis that's not true, and I don't know what they're telling my son. Right. You know, and I've never did anything like that. So there's no reason why it should be on there. Even the doctor done signed off on it and said, it's, it's an error. But it's an error for five years. I had to walk around like that, and it's not fair. That's a terrible, terrible stigma to have now. I just wanted to share with you briefly, there's a, um, there's a story that kind of ties in with yours, and I'll just try to take a quick minute to tell this, but there's a mom, and I can't remember where she is, but um, I spoke to her a few weeks back, and she was actually put on the sex registry, and the reason was that she fled with her child in order to protect that child from abuse with dad. So your, yours is not the first case of <clears throat> misdiagnosis by CPS that I am aware of. <clears throat> and I just wanted to say I'm really sorry that you've been put through that. To have that placed on you is just, I can't even imagine. That's terrible. Um, I, it's my understanding that they gave you Seroquel yes, to treat you. Can you tell me a little bit about that and what, what that was about? Yes, ma'am. Um, when I first got out of rehab after completing three months and getting my certificate, I came back in the foster care. They would not allow me to see my son in them three months, but they did allow my dad to see him at the time, and my dad's visits got ripped from him for no reason. Um, and then when I got out, they sent me to the psychologist that's at Child and Family Services on Five Oaks Drive, Dr. Zach. And he diagnosed me with bipolar, and then they started writing up a whole bunch of paperwork and all kinds of things, which is not true. They went on my mom's, my biological mom's diagnosis and diagnosed me with bipolar. Then they put me on 800 milligrams. They started me off slow, like 200, 300, and they kept raising it. And I was told that if I did not take the medication that I was never going to see my son again. They were going to make sure I never seen them again. So I had to do what they told me to do. Okay. And, and you've also been diagnosed with post-tremendous stress disorder. And what exactly was that from? Yes, ma'am. Um, just from everything that I've been through in my life, you know, the loss of my son has brought great traumatic experience to my life. Um, I'll just break down crying some days. You know, some days I just can't handle it. I don't want to be around people. I don't want to see kids because it all, it just comes up, all them feelings, you know, and then when I see the caseworker or to see the people around town, you know, it just brings up all that, all them feelings of like how I was wrongly done, you know, and the traumatic part about it, it's like torture taking a child from their mother and taking the child, you know, off somewhere. You don't, you know, he, the kid don't know anything, you know, I don't know anything. I can't protect him and like with the pedophilia stuff, it's like, are you molesting my son? Like, that's the first thing that comes to my mind. Why would you want this on my paperwork so much? You know, you went through all this work to get this on my paperwork. Now, after five years, I got it removed. I want to know, are you molesting my son? Right.
Right. Yeah, I think that's a question that most parents would ask if they had been incorrectly given that diagnosis right. that there's there's got to be something and it's just really unfortunate that everything your son has to go through now. I understand in 2008 that they wanted you to um, take less psychiatric medications. Well, and uh, it was like 4, 2008, 3, 2008, around that area, I had went to my primary care physician, and she had told me, I'm not going to say her name for, you know, reasons or whatever, but she had told me I was on way too much medication. So she, I got the paper here. She put me on 75 milligrams of Effexor. Um, and so I got off of it, and then it was like, this is 419 2008 that they I was on the effects here, so they started to weed me up and then like right after that everything went down like they started to take less from me you know call my call me and tell me my son couldn't come to the visit because he was sick like you know it was just an excuse after excuse not coming to do a home study I had been waiting for like a whole year for him to come look at the house that I had for my son the room that I had for him, you know, the food that I had in the fridge, they refused to come. I was working. I was doing everything I could when in the year and a half fight to try to get my son back. And that sounds a lot like our um, previous guest was saying that fathers do as well or unhealthy parents. Right. <clears throat> okay. And it's my understanding that the, the paperwork is to be signed by... Um, the caseworker that's dealing with your case and why didn't he um, report that to the court that he was on the case? Yes ma'am. Um, Child and Family Services on Five Oaks Drive first had Christine Sayers as my caseworker. She was my caseworker for about close to a year and then when the six months before they forced me to sign off they brought on Stephen Holmes um, his name is Stephen Holmes at Child and Family Services on Five Oaks Drive. They brought him in on my case and in my court paperwork that I had received a copy of, he never reported himself as the caseworker. And there is a section on here on the back of the page and this is from 5 2008 when he was my caseworker because I got a paper right here saying that he was my caseworker his name is circled right here Stephen Holmes Five Oaks Drive Child and Family Services 5 2008 that's from 4 19 2008 he was my caseworker until the end and right here is a little section excuse me right here on the back, you see where it has who gets all the copies? Why is Christine Sayers still on there at the end of the fight when Stephen Holmes was on my case? Right. So if CMH was found um, incompetent due to the false diagnosis that was given to you, um, what is the reason they're giving you now that you and your son can't be reunited? We just have a few more minutes, okay. but I would like to know what they're telling you. Um, from community mental health standpoint, um, this is just one error that they found, the pedophilia diagnosis, which they done signed off on and said this is an error. Okay, it's an error after five years I've been walking around with this. So I've been talking to caseworkers up there and stuff, and I believe, personally, that they're all working together. They don't, none of them want to see me get my son back because the money keeps flowing in and they're going to keep getting cash for my son, Social Security and whatever they need, you know, from the federal government and the state to take care of him. And I believe that community mental health is working with them to keep my son from me. Right. And they're not willing to, I, I asked them, I told them I want a whole new case number. I want a whole new case because none of this stuff you can't prove any of this stuff it's all written up like even that pedophilia that's the worst thing that you can give somebody like that should show right there that the whole record is just is a void there's nothing that they can do now if there's anything you would like to say to Robert that he could hear now or <clears throat> within the next few years or at any time what would you tell your son that I love you 
you can look right over at that camera and talk to him. That I love you, Robert, and Steve Holmes is not your father, and I know that he's raising you right now after he forced me to sign off my rights. And now he's raising you. His son took you from all your family. We love you. We're praying for you. And I just pray that God just keep his hand over your life and that you become the man of God that, he, that he's designed you to be. And you're always in my heart. And I just celebrated your 10th birthday without you. I'm so sorry, Cassandra. I had a cake for you and, you know, I gave a couple a football and a basketball to a needy couple for your birthday and I love you and I'm praying for you and I'm always going to keep this last picture you gave me and I just pray that Steve Holmes and you guys realize what you did by kidnapping my son it was not right and it's not legal and I am coming after you a very handsome young man yes, um we thank you so much for being on the show. I know this was not easy for you. Um, that's why we're doing what we're doing, to expose the corruption that's taken place. Thank you so much, Cassandra. You. If you would like to be a guest on Silent Voices, contact us at miparentalrights at gmail.com. That's miparentalrights at gmail.com. Parental rights. Freedom to raise up your sons and your daughters according to your conscience and convictions. In America, this has always been a privilege. But would you believe there are those who wish it were otherwise? This traditional parent-child relationship is currently under a shadow of political threat. Help preserve parental rights. Support the Constitutional Amendment. I want to thank you, the viewers, for tuning in this week. You can catch us each week, same channel. Until next week, my friends, remember, your, your voice, voice can, can make, make the, the difference. difference.